Good evening, guys. Um, I'm going to give it just a few minutes and see if there is anybody on here. Um, we had to go live just a few minutes later um, because I was uh, waiting to get on here. I had a friend who was was on a podcast. If you guys um, were able to check out The Wicked Woman, you saw my friend Christy Sumner on there. And so we were giving everyone a minute to hop off that podcast and, and come on over here and join us. Looks like we got Sheila Brown here and Janet Alms. Thank you all so much for tuning in. And, you know, thank you guys for watching uh, episode two of season three. Um, hey, Ernie. Hey, Chris. Um, if you guys will just comment over here, you know, if I'm not friends with you guys, I don't know who you are. Um, it just shows up a number and not a name. And so I like to be able to, uh, talk directly with you guys. So, um, so anyways, uh, again, thank you all for watching episode two of season three. Um, I realized it was something just a little bit different from what I've put out on some of the other episodes and honestly is a little more traditional to what Ghost Biker was set up to be, um, as far as visiting some of these smaller and more obscure locations that cover the really rich history. Um, so if you haven't seen it, I hope you will go and check it out. And if you have, I look forward to seeing your comments and a answering some questions about that. Um, what's interesting about this location is it was in uh, High Cliff, Tennessee, which is a very small rural community, um, a mining town to be exact but a very small community right on the Tennessee-Kentucky line in uh, northeastern Tennessee. And it's just about three miles from Jellico. And if you all have watched some of my previous videos, we did a ride earlier this summer and rode through that area, 25 West, and we actually covered some of the interesting facts about Jellico and this troop train accident. And that is actually how I found out about it. Um, as far as the actual location itself, um, it, it is literally, so, so 25 West is this really beautiful scenic mountain road that, um, I actually got on it in, uh, Caraval in Campbell County, Tennessee and rode up the mountain. And I mean, you go through some, some beautiful area. The road is a little, um, there's not much of a shoulder on most of the road and, there are some, um, you know, break-offs on the road and that sort of thing. But it's, it's very beautiful. It runs parallel to the Clear Fork River and also the railroad tracks. So you've kind of got this, this uh, the river sandwiched in between the road and the railroad tracks. And as you're going up the hillside, I had heard of the, the uh, troop train accident, but didn't know all of the history behind it. Um, you know, just, just from growing up, I just heard about it, but I didn't really know how, just how bad it was. And so as I'm riding along mapping this route, um, you, you literally come to this sign that's like not bigger than, you know, maybe six by six inches. And it, it just says 1944 troop train um, memorial with a set of binoculars on it. And of course, if you look, it's just nothing but, you know, a curtain of, of solid trees. And so, um, you know, that made me want to look up more about it. And, you know, we, we often as, as bikers or as individuals out traveling, we often will find locations like this where, you know, you're driving down the road and either you're passing too fast to, to read the entire sign or, um, you're passing along and, you know, we'll see it, but you've got to look it up because there's not a lot of information. And so that was sort of the situation with this. And once I started looking into it and finding the whole story, just the accounts from survivors, because there were a lot of survivors. There were a lot that perished, but there were a lot of survivors of this one and the stories behind it. And, you know, I actually, this week after the episode, ended up talking to several different folks that had said that they didn't, um, you know, that, that their family, you know, they were from, you know, Southwest Virginia or um, from Indiana. 
tell me that some of their family had actually been on that troop train accident. So it started a dialogue, which, which was really cool. Um, you know, I'm, I'm manning the comments over here, so I'm going to kind of go back and forth. So if I miss your question, I'm going to try to get to it here in a second. Um, hey to Jim Owens, Penny King, Matt Waddell, um, Kevin Robbins, uh, Insane Asylum, Paranormal. Um, welcome, you guys. Uh, and like I said, if you have any, any questions or anything at all, please let me know. Um, <clears throat> so... You know, so I wanted to really cover this location. And so after um, after driving the route and actually finding a spot to pull off, I mean, there were very limited places to pull off here. Um, I went and hiked down to the location. And, you know, I wasn't sure as far as being able to go after dark or what the terrain or what the situation was actually going to be like. And so, um, you know, hiked down there. And it was a pretty pretty tough hike down the first day um, but I wanted to make sure I knew that I was going to have a hard time getting uh, EVP evidence just because it's so loud you know the the recorders are, are extra sensitive and so picking up the road noise from the road and then also the the water noise and and just the the nature around um, I knew that there could be possibly a lot of pareidolia and so um, so anyways, just going down there and spending, I was probably down there for about three hours on the first investigation and didn't really even know if I was going to be able to make it down to the actual site. I mean, I was just happy to be down there by the river. And, um, you know, because again, right there in front of the site, there's not an easy, easy pull off. So once we hiked down, I had to actually hike down the river. And the first day that I was there, we had had a lot of rain in that area. And so um, once you get so far, the bank just ends and uh, it's just nothing but, but solid rocks. And so there were trees down and there were um, rocks along the way that we couldn't actually get to. Um, Vicki Norris says, love the part about the waterfall. And then you go down there and there's a small waterfall. So what was really cool about that is you guys know how spirit boxes are and sometimes you know sometimes they're they're really noisy and loud and and picking up radio stations and such the area that i was in um i mean it's in the middle of this um you know this kind of i mean it's on top of the mountain but the water was down in the valley um with the road and the uh, railroad up high on each side and um you know, you couldn't pick up any radio stations. And other than the three responses that I got on the spirit box, there was no other communication. I mean, it was just completely quiet, which I felt was, was compelling. And the waterfall was so clear. Um, and so, um, you know, we did get one EVP, but didn't hear that in the moment. Uh, we actually heard that, you know, that after the fact, but, um, so when I had the opportunity to go back the next week when I went into town and uh, once we hiked down there, um, from my research, I had found that on that big giant rock, there used to actually be a memorial on the giant rock there in, um, in the Jellicoe Narrows. And, um, you know, of course, when we got there, it wasn't there. And from what we found out, um, that was actually put up in 2001 and dedicated by the local Boy Scout troop. They had put that up there to remember the uh, victims. And so, um, and you could see it on the rock, you know, that uh, where it had, had actually been on there. So once we got down there, that was a very cool surprise to be able to see the waterfall, which to me lended um, credibility to what we got on the spirit box, especially since there was no other type of activity on there. Um, Vicki also mentions uh, my, my hiking stick. Um, that was actually a really cool find, you know. Sometimes things just happen, you know. There's, there's no such thing as coincidence. And on that next week when I was hiking down there through the rocks, um, I mean, I wish I should have worn my body camera the entire time while I was hiking because there were a lot of struggles, a lot of slips. Uh, a lot of slides, a lot of uh, near misses, losing equipment, that sort of thing. 
um, just to get there. And there just happened to be this stick that I grabbed a hold of uh, when I was about halfway through the journey. And so um, that was, uh, I used that the entire time. That was my staff and actually saved me from falling uh, a couple times. So um, anyways, yes. Yeah, so the second time that we went back, um, there was no spirit box activity. Uh, the REM pod did go off, um, but um, there was no rod activity. And that's one of the things that I, I did bring uh, in here into my office for, um, for discussion, because that's one of the tools that I love to use when I go on these investigations. I know the, the spirit box, REM pod, all of that is, is a little controversial. Um, and it's not something that I always use on investigations. I'll have those up using those when, you know, to try to use in conjunction with other pieces. But one thing that I will always use when I'm on investigations are my rods. And, um, you know, I had, after the episode aired, I had received a lot of questions about those. Um, I know a lot of folks have, you know, on investigations, they use them and have had great success. You know, they are a divination tool. And, um, you know, the old timers used to use them for finding water or, you know, they use them for finding, you know, grave sites or even for uh, finding different uh, underground minerals. And so I know they're a little controversial, but, um, you know, because it is a pseudoscience and uh, sometimes people will liken it to, you know, the movement. Now, I don't use a Ouija board, so uh, and to be completely truthful, have never used one. But um, I know, you know, the mechanics behind what, you know, when they're talking about the hands moving the, the um, planchette and, you know, kind of the, um, you know, they talk about it being an idiomotor um, movement, you know, that's causing that. And so, you know, people will say that that's potentially the, you know, same situation with the rods. But, um, you know, I, I've never used one of those or, you know, and I've tried using a pendulum. But for me, I have greater success with the rods. And I just want to take a few minutes to, you know, show those. I hope you can see this. This new Facebook format is a little strange um, because all I have is just a little picture at the very bottom. So I can't exactly see myself very well. So I hope you can see. Um, but the rods, they're these L-shaped rods. Some people make them themselves out of coat hangers. Other people will use a Y-shaped stick. Um, from you know a willow tree or different fruit or nut trees and but these in particular ones they have this um, sheath on the end and if you look I mean it is just it free spins and so it's very very difficult to control when you have it locked in your hand I mean it will completely spin and so when you have a steady hand and you're holding it there um, one thing you know about it is you know you set your parameters of your yes and no and that really just depends you know on on how you want to set that up I use crossing the rods for um, yes keeping them open for no and one of the things I like to do is also ask them to point in a particular direction and so um, the the interesting thing about that session that we did, I feel like we had a conversation with a gentleman um, from the train wreck who was from Ohio, specifically Canton, Ohio. And um, when I was able to ask, you know, because again, at that particular time, I hadn't been down to the actual train wreck site. Um, it was behind me sort of at, you know, my five o'clock and, um, I didn't know exactly where it was, but I knew it was down in that direction. And so for the rods to actually spin back and point in that direction and stop, you know, at kind of at my five o'clock, it was a very controlled motion. And again, with the free spinning nature of these rods, even with your hands at their most steadiest, it's very, very challenging and very difficult to be able to um, stop it at a specific point, especially when it's, it's pulling and moving. And I love to actually do demonstrations with these rods because I feel, you know, at people who have never used them before, when they actually have them in their hands and they're able to 
clear their minds and focus. And, and that's a big, for me, that's a big important part is to be able to, you know, relax and, you know, suppress all of, you know, your, the, you know, rational thoughts in your mind and, and all rationalizations. Um, you're able to really, you know, work those rods. Um, a couple comments over here, Sheila Brown. Um, she likes to use the rods. Uh, Insane Asylum asks if these are copper. And yes, the particular pair that I use, I've got several pairs. Um, this particular pair that I like to use and have success with is a copper rod. Um, Vicki Norris says she's tried using rods but can't get them to work, but loves watching other people use them. And that's that's what, you know, I've found in some of these different situations are that, you know, um, it, it's a tool that works for me. You know, we all have our different favorites. I like these specific tools because, you know, my dad and my grandmother told me stories about witching water and um, finding water back, you know, when they were putting wells in when, um, you know, my dad was young, when my grandmother was young. And so, um, so there's a very old history. I mean, the history truly goes back uh, from what I, when I was researching um, the history of the rods, the history goes back all the way to cave drawings and back to um, the time of the Chinese and uh, in the African nation. Um, but, you know, what's interesting about it is when you're dealing with these spirits, they're very familiar with these rods and they're very easy for the spirits to be able to communicate with. So not only do they know them for their utilitarian purposes, but you're not asking them to touch a light or touch something that, that might scare them. So, um, you know, it's just something basically touch and cross or touch and point. So, um, so I, I absolutely love them. They work great for me, but I know that there are some people that actually, you know, will use pendulums and other items. Um, they don't work for everybody. And when I'm at different, uh, investigations, um, where they don't work to me, it just, it just kind of lends validation to the times that they that they do work um, because when I have a it, it's it's sort of like a light switch when I have a good session with them I mean it's on I mean the they're really just communicating very clear and concise answers but when they're not those rods it's almost like there's a force and you just can't feel the movement um, I'm gonna go to a couple more questions Vicki says, what type of feeling did you pick up down at the rock? Were you able to pick up any automatic writing or drawing? Um, you know, I did not try uh, doing any type of automatic writing or drawing down there. While that would have actually been an amazing place to do that. Um, you know, when I went and got down there the first time, it was um, later in the afternoon. And so I wanted to make sure it was out of there by dark. But I will tell you this, as soon as I walked down to the water side, um, it was the most overwhelming feeling, um, feeling of sadness. Um, it, it was very intense and almost overwhelming. Um, you know, just, just to know, I mean, these, you know, what happened there. And then also, you know, the, the big large train um, derailing, you know, it, it it was something I really couldn't explain other than just very emotional and very overwhelming. I really had to collect myself um, just because of that intense emotion. Um, <clears throat> more overwhelming than sad sadness, if you will. Um, but I would like to go back and, you know, um, see if I can pick up on any type of drawing. And maybe I will at some point. But for the most part, um, you know, it was, I wasn't really, you know, sure. Plus, plus with uh, my motorcycle being parked up on the side of uh, this mountain road on a tiny little, um, tiny little shoulder, I was kind of nervous about leaving my bike there. Um, so I was kind of wanting to just, you know, spend a few hours and that was about it. Um, but I would like to go back and, and maybe try that. Um, Chad Phillips says it's great to feel the energy through them. I get them vibrating at times, and and yes, that is actually uh, a feeling that um, that I'll get and actually got that day. Um, 
the the push on the rods pointing down to the location um there was a intense vibration almost electrical feeling um if if that makes sense um it's it's really hard to describe sometimes because whenever you're sitting there and you start feeling this um you know it's it's unmistakable you know i will do sometimes experiments with with a blindfold when i'm doing the rods um, just to, you know, it depends on where I'm at, but I like to blindfold myself and ask questions or, you know, we were, this location being as unique as it was because we were literally, again, there was very little bank, um, or shoreline that we were able to stand on. So, um, Christy had to get very creative with filming. I mean, we were on a rock that was maybe about... 10 feet long and about maybe four feet wide um, to try to do the investigation. So um, having to get these, you know, creative angles with filming and capture the questions as well as the evidence and then also being able to, um, you know, ask, you know, conduct an investigation was really interesting. So, um, so yes, those rods were definitely uh, vibrating. Um, Jim Owen says, next time you go, let me know. I would like to go along. Um, yeah, I, I definitely encourage people to check out this area, um, up in, uh, um, up in High Cliff. I mean, it's, it's, it's beautiful. And, you know, I don't know, again, I don't know why the monument is not there, but, um, it would, um, it, I'm sure it was something really impressive to see because that was, that was a huge rock. Um, Chad says, I did notice, okay, um, I did notice the vibration, you, you know, you have a strong connection. Yes, absolutely. Um, Chris Sumner says, yes, I almost lost, uh, my camera girl a couple times. Um, glad there was no blooper reel. Uh, that is very true. Like I said, um, I really needed the camera going while we were hiking there because there was, uh, there was a lot going on um, and Sheila Brown says it's a different kind of energy um, and and it truly is so I was glad to be able to do that in combination with the different tools um, the EDI box that's another one that I really enjoy using that I utilized a lot during this investigation um, if if you don't use one I would highly recommend it you know I try to take a very scientific approach with a lot of the different uh, questions that I'm asking and with during the investigation and as far as as this it it allows you to keep the uh, temperature in real time it also has a geofoam on it uh, I know you guys you know see me explaining a lot when I'm in the episode what the device does I often feel like I, I, I should do that when I'm talking to some of um, the spirits because you know when they were alive they didn't have those types of tools so I'm always trying to explain what's going on and that it, it is okay for them to touch uh, it also has an EMF detector on it which will show if there's a spike and then also if there are any pressure changes and so so I really like that and so what was interesting was you know we tried several different things playing you know some army marches uh, playing some train sounds as well as uh, military recruitment ads from the 1940s and what was interesting you know on the variety of music that we played um, we were also playing um, playing the uh, you know it was a time of excitement you know um, these these guys um, they you know some of them were drafted and some of them enlisted they were proud to go out and to fight for their country and when the military song played the temperature started um, you know like it moving and changing like it was marching to the beat and that was very cool that was a very emotional experience for me because um, you could just you could just feel the sense of pride when um, that started marching. I mean, that was, that was very, very cool for me and unlike anything that I had experienced. And then when I changed the tone and was playing taps, there wasn't that uh, jumping or marching sound. The temperature did change and it did drop a little bit, but um, it wasn't going up and down 
to the beat of the music, which was pretty amazing. And um, the same thing on the military recruitment ad. I chose a specific ad that was from Pittsburgh and played during a um, uh, movie in 1944. They used to advertise uh, at the box office. And, um, you know, this was one in particular about uh, bombardiers. And so what was interesting about that is there was no movement, no change in the temperature until they started dropping bombs. And, uh, you know, again, you could just feel that sense of excitement. Um, so that was, that was very interesting um, for me. Uh, again, I'm going to look at a few of these. Um, Chad says, and, and Chad is from Australia, so I actually connected with him the other night while we were watching the episode, so um, shout out to Southern Australia. Um, he says, my missus could see your aura around you while you were sitting peacefully on the rock and had a strong, respectful connection with these young men. Um, thank you for noticing that. Um, that was something that I wanted to really go into with this, and I go into all my investigations with a sense of respect and um you know these guys they they paid the ultimate sacrifice and so um i'm glad that was noticed and i feel that that is why we were able to actually get some responses um john shanning says i love your show and love what you're doing and i sure do miss tennessee um that area you know again i talk about the overwhelming feeling when i went to that that spot um you know, it was also just because of the beauty. And, and it's interesting because you could really tell that no one had been down there for a long time. Um, there was a, you know, a little bit of debris, I think like an old jacket and a, a cooler, but you could tell that these items had been washed down from somewhere during a flood. And, you know, there were no footprints. There was um, nothing around. I mean, cause it's not easily accessed and there were no houses or anything around down there on the river. So, um, you know, that was the beautiful part about it is you just really had this sense of peace and um, it was it was very cool. Um, let's see. Uh, look in here. Like I said, I'm sorry if I uh, missed missed any comments or anything here. Um, Again, that was one of one of my favorite episodes to do. I wanted to be able to also show one of the questions that I get all the time is why do you um, why do you investigate after dark? And again, I don't always. Um, I investigate at all times of the day. It just so happens that a lot of the locations that I cover are either in a downtown area that's really busy or off of a busy road um, that requires, you know, s nighttime when it's, when it's quieter. I mean, yeah, it can be creepier to be in a location when it's dark, but I actually like light when I'm on an investigation because I feel like, you know, I don't, I don't typically, I do use static cameras, which are IR based, but when I'm filming the episode, I don't um, walk around with an IR camera. We actually use a light. And, and film and very rarely um, do, unless I've just got a quiet EVP session going uh, when I'm filming, I like the light because I feel you can actually see um, movement and shadow play a lot easier when you've got that ambient light. And so, um, <clears throat> so for me, I wanted to be able to show that not all investigations have to be creepy or have to be intense and dark. Um, you know, this was a very sad story. Um, and once I went into researching, um, very detailed and very graphic about how some of these, uh, poor soldiers ended up passing away. I mean, some of the accounts, you know, we're, we're talking about people who were pierced with steel rods and who, um, they laid there trying to be rescued. And, you know, their comrade was, you know, um, near them uh passed away you know just kind of hanging in the wreckage and so um you know the the accident happened it was about 9 45 at night so um and then judging by the terrain i have so much more respect after trying to hike down myself 
I can only imagine how hard it was for the rescuers to get down from, from that location, regardless of what side they went down, whether it was from the railroad track side or from the road side, it was very, very challenging to get down to. So I know that in a rescue effort, that would have been extremely tough. And so, um, you know, reading these accounts, you know, a lot of the people, they were, they were scalded, especially the ones that were in the first car behind the engine. And um, the engineer, Mr. I believe his name was uh, Robbins, um, he, I, I said it in the episode, the, the name escapes me at, at this moment, but I believe it was Robbins. And, um, you know, he died instantly. And so um, one of the things I didn't cover as much, which was interesting with a couple of the responses that I got, was what caused the accident. And so, um, you know, again, the, the river runs parallel to the railroad track. And as you go down, the bank disappears, it's all rocks, and it's on a curve. And so, uh, again, like I said, it gets real narrow. It's called the Jellico Narrows. And um, that curve is an 11 degree arc. And so there was, they actually didn't release the exact cause of the accident. Um, they said that they thought it was because of a high rate of speed that the train was running behind and that there was um, an axle issue. And because of that narrow arc on the track, and I think they said it was the worst curve on the entire L&N Railroad uh, line there, and that ac the damaged axle along with the arc is what caused the accident to happen. But the interesting part about that is there was speculation um, and they actually shut down the road, they shut down the press, because this happened so close to the town of Oak Ridge, which, you know, if you're from the area, a lot of you guys know the history of the Secret City. And so what's neat about that is, you know, of course, that's where uh, the bombs and everything at, for the war were uh, developed. And so um, there was a theory that this accident was caused by espionage. And so they actually shut the press down for a while. And that's part of the reason why um, the story is gets a little bit um, sparse on information when it comes to what actually happened with the accident. And then, of course, you know, they speculated that potentially maybe the engineer had been drunk. Um, but, um, you know, the interesting part was that about, about the espionage and the lack of information. Um, once we got down to the actual wreck site and was sitting there, I was using my ovulus and as a lot of you know, sometimes those ovuluses can get really chatty and just kind of seem like they're spitting out just crazy mumbo jumbo sometimes. And you really have to analyze, you know, your, your situation and your atmosphere and everything when you're using those. But what was really cool about that is the fact that once I pulled the flag out and got to the actual location, the two, the only two words that came up on the ovulus the entire time of the investigation was cause and rate. Now, I have a couple different theories on that. Um, you know, when I, when I showed the flag um, is when I got the word cause. And, you know, you could say the reason that the troops were on the flag was because they were fighting for their cause, which was the country. But coupling that with directly after when they got the word rate, to me, it, it sort of sounded like that maybe the cause of the accident was the rate of speed. Again, I'm, I'm, I'm just speculating, but if you've used an ovul ovulus, you know how, um, how tricky those can be sometimes with some of the words they're spitting out. So it was interesting that uh, those were the only two words on both of those investigations that we actually received on there. Um, let's see, back to the questions. Uh, uh, Ernie Pack says, uh, I worked on the railroad for several years. There's a lot of paranormal stories along the tracks, more tragedies than you might imagine. It, that's, that's unfortunately true. Um, you know, one of the, if, if you've watched my past episodes, um, there is always an episode in a ghost biker season that, uh, is you know about something that happened on the tracks which uh, is is interesting because I mean I've always been fascinated by the railroad and by trains 
uh, and love train travel. But um, it just seems like uh, that's kind of something that I'm drawn to. And, you know, my very first episode, the little girl who uh, was in the bleeding mausoleum, little Nina, she was killed when um, she was her horse and carriage was actually hit by a train when the horse got spooked. The second episode was the ghost on the tracks. Um, you know, it just always seems like the episodes kind of go in that direction. So it was it was really an honor to be able to share this history and then also be able to share this this different style of investigation. So I, I, I totally understand, Ernie. Uh, and there's it's it's amazing just some of the stories around the uh, country about that. Um, let's see. Sheila Brown asked, do I ever get worried being alone? Um, you know, and, and that's something that I've been asked on several different podcasts. Um, I recently did one with, uh, some, some folks from England and they said, you know, that's typically something they don't do over there. There's not a lot of alone investigating. Um, you know, it's, it has its own challenges. Um, I enjoyed when I was with a team and I enjoy doing collaborations because you really are able to feed off of the questions and feed off of the energy from other investigators. So that's always um, something that is a lot of fun and a lot of help when doing these investigations. Um, I find that when I go, I have to do a lot of pre-planning with my history. If, if it's an exceptionally dark location, um, I will not go alone. Um, I will always either have a camera person with me or, um, you know, I'll do that as a collaboration investigation. Um, and also a lot of these locations that we investigate are not usually in the best of areas. And so, um, you know, you have to, you have to take your spiritual protection, um, you know, keep that first and foremost, and then you also have to uh, take physical protection into account. Um, you know, so uh, depending on the state I'm in, I always have um, some type of firearm with me just, just because, you know, I, I do have my concealed carry. But, um, you know, but I always have some with one with me. Other times, uh, I did some earlier investigations earlier this year that um, they're they're not part of the season, but they will actually be some uh, mini episodes that will be released at a later date. But um, I investigated, did a two night investigation um, where I hit one location on a Friday night and a different location on a Saturday. It was part of a um, collaboration weekend where the other team that I was collaborating with, um, which, which was Soul Sisters Paranormal, they investigated a separate, lo the second location on the night that uh, I investigated the first location and then we switched out on the second night. So we were, you know, five to 10 miles apart. So I will do investigations like that, or I will have, um, the person who is the owner of the location or the owner of the land on, uh, you know, speed dial to where, and we will check in throughout the night. So, uh, I always want to make sure that, that all of that is accounted for. Um, Chad Phillips says eliminates contamination. Humans are scarier than spirits. And that is very true. Uh, I often get asked if I get creeped out when I'm doing investigations. And uh, I'll tell you, it's the living that creeps me out more. And being a biker and riding to these locations, I am truthfully more scared of the idiots on the road than I am of the um, spirits at these different locations because you you really do have to be very vigilant because you see them most of the time they don't see you because people don't people don't watch and people don't pay attention um, and that's kind of one of the things when it comes to uh, um, you know spirit activity people you know things are always happening around us people just don't take the time to see and hear um, you know, and, and Chad is right. It does eliminate the contamination. Um, I like to honestly investigate with fewer people because the more outside contamination that I can account for, the better. And I knew that that was going to be a big challenge at this location. Um, that's why I really didn't go in. I had three recorders going, um, plus my, my video camera 
while I was there. Um, but I was really not expecting to get a lot of vo vocal activity because, you know, the audio paradalia um, can sound just like voices depending on the type of recorder that you're listening to. So I was really concerned about some of the nature going on around. Um, that, like I said, we did get one EVP that um, was really interesting. It, it seemed to be intelligent. Uh, we've got that noted on the video. I believe it was when I asked the question if um, the soldier I was speaking to was going to Europe to fight. And when I asked that, got a clear yes, uh, Mel Whisper, and we got a clear answer of yes at the same time on the spirit rods. So um, that was a nice little unexpected find. Uh, let's see. Uh, Chad says, like me, I take it you trust your gut feeling over any device. And that's very true. And I've, I've investigated with a lot of different investigators that, that are the same way. I feel it's something that um, you have to be, you know, careful with. Because, again, you know, what we're doing, um, very few pieces, I mean, other than a temperature gauge um, or an EMF detector, I mean, what we're dealing with is really up for interpretation and people are always criticizing, scrutinizing and trying to debunk everything that, that we do. Um, a lot of the time there is uh, a type of um, explanation, you know, um, for, for what we're doing. The majority of things we're experiencing are not paranormal, but there are a lot of unexplained things. And so um, I do trust my gut and if I'm, you know, I always go by the philosophy, if in doubt, throw it out, you know. Um, if it can be questioned, but, or I mean, if it can't, if it can be explained, but one of the things that personally myself that I like to do is I like to use the flashlights and I, I do like to use, um, again, the EDI box is one of my favorite and I'm always using it in conjunction with these other pieces. A flashlight going off is great, but a flashlight going off with a temperature change or a pressure change or an SLS camera. Um, I do use those on different occasions. And I know that you can get a lot of false positives with those, but when you're sitting in an area and you're keeping the camera stationary, so it's not having to remap every time you move, um, when you start getting shifts in your temperature or in different, you know, scientific um, areas that are solid, like I said, you can't hardly debunk a temperature change because that's, you know, a uh, solid scientific thing. But when you're getting these interactions happening at the same time, then, um, you know, they just corroborate each other. So, um, so that's the way I like to, you know, put my evidence out there are using different pieces together and then just using my gut. When I go into a location, I do a lot of research beforehand and I'll try to decide where I want to investigate, but I really listen to my gut and listen to how I feel of where I need to investigate and what experiments I need to do. And I may have something completely planned out, but once I get there, um, you know, my gut may say, you know, do this and everything else is kind of out the window. So um, I've investigated with several people that are, are like that. Um, let's see. Uh, and, and thank you, Chad. He said, I did an amazing job with... Uh, my family background and the forces, uh, I had a great connection there, uh, even left us briefly a couple times, but you were in a good place. Um, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. It was, um, it, it was, it was tough, you know, um, it was a tough investigation, but it was one that, like I said, I was, I was really honored to be able to share the story, um, you know, again, and kind of bring light to this, this little tiny roadside memorial that actually had a, a big impact on a lot of families and on, uh, you know, on history in and of itself, just being such a uh, um, dangerous, I mean, excuse me, such a tragic um, accident. Uh, is, is there any other questions over here, maybe about any techniques or... Um, you know, any, uh, anything that was, was in the episodes. Um, I wanted to, you know, I wanted, I had several people contact me about the, uh, uh memorial that I did at the end. 
Um, again, that was something that I felt was important to do. The, um, you know, these, these, these folks, you know, took the time to, to talk to me while, you know, we were, uh, doing the investigation and, um, I felt that it was only appropriate to, um, you know, show, show respect and, and, uh, do a memorial for them at the end. Um, and it was also important to me, you know, it was, it was really interesting doing the research because I found so much information about it. And I actually found several books that I want to, to read after, you know, I found them after the fact. So I would like to check out cause there's more information, um, on that history, but it was, in, it was, important to me to actually show the pictures that I was able to find of these guys to, to show a, a more human um, aspect of the entire investigation. You know, I think that sometimes, you know, we know a name and we know um, a story, but we don't always know a face behind it. And for me, it was, it was important to be able to show that human side and, and show that face of the folks who lost their life in that accident and that we were um, hopefully communicating with. Um, let's see. Hello, Denise. Thank you for coming on. Um, Janet says, have you heard of or tried something called shepherd tone technique? Um, actually, that is something I haven't heard of and will definitely... Um, check out. Uh, I'm always looking for new techniques and new things to try when I go to these investigations because, you know, it's, you can go and you can ask, you know, if there's anyone here with us all day long. Um, but, you know, to be able to try some different techniques and, and share information. We were just in a, a podcast just before this where we were talking about learning from other people. And that's what's been really cool is being able to, um, you know, meet some of these other investigators and learn and hear about other techniques. So I apologize, Janet, I have not heard of that, but I will definitely look that up and uh, maybe try it on one of my next investigations. Um, Chad says, uh, Lenny Taylor, my partner says, hi, she's from the UK living in Australia and loves that we have found your channel. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, I really appreciate that. You know, again, what what we try to do with Ghost Biker Explorations is really hit these different locations that um, are lesser known and that uh, has that real historical punch that, um, you know, people people may not know about. I often say that, you know, again, a lot of bikers, they um, we go to all these different locations to go to the different destinations, but we don't often know what we're passing on the side of the road and so to be able to share those stories and put that out there and be able to conduct investigations with them just um, really is it really is an honor and a, a dream come true to be able to do um, so so thank you all and and, and welcome uh, that really does mean a lot um, John Channing says history is one of my favorite parts of ghost hunting uh, I wholeheartedly agree 100%. You know, for me, um, the history is for first and foremost, the travel is second, and the paranormal is actually third when it comes to my episodes. Um, I like to visit different locations to where, and I'll even highlight them on the show where, you know, and, and, and I, to be completely transparent and honest, I really did not expect to get very much activity at this location, um, you know, kind of took a, a gamble going out and, you know, doing it for an episode. But I like to pick places to where if there is no activity, I still want to highlight it in the show because I want to be able to share that story. And I really didn't know what we would be finding down there if, um, you know, because again, using some of these different pieces of equipment, you don't know if you're going to get the REM pod going off or the spirit box picking up a bunch of radio stations or, or what have you. So, um, you know, the history is definitely my favorite and being able to showcase that whether there's paranormal activity or not is definitely um, one of, you know, something that's, that's paramount to, uh, to my episodes. Um, Chris Sumner says, agreed, finding like-minding investigators is refreshing. And that statement is so true because 
Um, there are a lot of investigators out there, and I've just got to say I've been fortunate enough, the ones that I have encountered have been very respectful, very history-driven, and uh, have, um, you know, like-minded, you know, Soul Sisters is, is definitely a group that, that I admire and, uh, you know, like to collaborate with. Uh, Insane Asylum says, first time watching. I really enjoyed this. I'm here just doing a bit of research for our upcoming show and I will watch more. Yes, thank you. Um, I will actually be uh, on their podcast, uh, I believe it's next Wednesday. Um, we started communicating today and um, I'm, thank you for watching, you know, and I uh, hope you enjoy um, more. You know, this is this is something, you know, I got to take you guys this um Thursday night's a little challenging because, you know, I'm sitting here and uh, having, you know, I feel like I'm, it, it's kind of, kind of feels like ghost hunting sometimes because you feel like you're not getting that back to, you know, feedback from another person uh, instantly. And so I feel like I'm just kind of sitting here. Uh, yes, I'm sorry. Uh, insane Asylum, um, the 28th, uh, I misspoke, um, the 28th of this month. So it'll be close to Halloween. Again, I apologize for that. Um, but, uh, yeah, so, so, you know, thank you for bearing with me. Thank you for your, your awesome questions and for, uh, interacting with me, um, because, um, hosting a solo live is, is a little challenging. So again, thank you. Um, let's see, uh, John Shanning says, uh, so you do an awesome job, uh, of telling the history of it. Um, yeah, that's that is something, you know, I always do in the episodes is is try to get as much history as I can. You know, putting these episodes together um, takes months um, just because of, you know, all the research that goes into finding these stories and the research of going to the libraries, going to the archives, talking to people who have been involved with some of uh, the history and then putting it together and then actually going and doing an investigation. And then of course, all of the evidence review um, that comes after, you know, I do a lot of filming in, I do first and second person filming where, um, you know, sometimes I'm filming myself and then other times uh, I have a person following me and filming. But what a lot of people don't know is I do also have static cams because I am one person and I'm trying to sometimes cover a lot of ground um, I will put static cams up. And so just going and reviewing all the static cams, all the audio and everything, and then putting together for an episode, um, is, is a lot of time in the making. So it really means a lot when you guys like, share, and help to get the word out. So I, I can't stress that enough. If there is an investigator or a team that you enjoy, definitely hit that like button and hit that share button because, um, it may seem like a little thing, but it, it, it truly does help and mean a lot. Um, let's see. Uh, let's see the, uh, Sheila says, you know, thank you for all you do. Um, you know, you're welcome. And, and, and thank you. Um, thank you for being a, a great investigator and inspiration as well. Sheila, um, Chad says that's the truth in reality of the paranormal while they're around, they may not want to be known or could be held back, but does show it's not always fast paced um, or edge of your seat type action. But being able to walk away in peace, know you were still respectful will be different next time in that location. And that's exactly right. You know, a lot of the time, again, the locations that I'm visiting um, may have never been investigated before, which was the case with this one. And so, um, you know, I, I can only imagine, you know, and one of the questions that I ask a lot is if they can see me, you know, um, you know, they may be just as, as scared of me and what I'm doing as some people are of the type of activity that they're experiencing from spirits. So, um, you know, that's one of the things that, that you have to kind of keep in mind with some of these, these newer locations. Um, they, they may not, they kind of sometimes have to learn how to react to you. And, um, you know, we are sort of in control there where the way we go into a location, whether it be, you know, um, having a clear mind and, and clear of everything else going on, because just as, as we're in, some of us are empaths and can pick up on the, um, activity around us, 
I feel like they can pick up on our energy and feed off of that as well. So, um, you know, so yes, it's definitely uh, something that is important. And I try to go in, you know, with, um, you know, it, my mind as clear as possible. And I notice the difference with that when I'm using the rods. If, you know, if I'm relaxed and my mind is clear, I tend to have better activity. Um, Janet says you should ask your camera person to co-host with you. I just might have to do that because, um, uh, you know, Chris has been uh, stepping in this season and really helping me out. If you all watch the past two seasons, I've, I've said it on podcast, but uh, my friend Josh Nyman helped me with seasons one and two. And uh, a lot of you got to know him and, uh, you know, his style and uh, just his personality. Um, there was a couple times he, he didn't always step out behind the camera, but you knew his voice. And, um, you know, so he helped me out. And then this season, you know, with everything going on this year, um, he's had a lot of family obligations. And, and the original concept of Ghost Biker was really truthfully set up to be a, um, you know, solo type uh, investigation. He was originally just setting me up to uh, help, I mean, film where I couldn't film and um, all the investigation was going to be completely solo and um, like everyone else that uh, starts paranormal investigating the bug bit him and uh, he really enjoyed it so um, so anyway so he he was with me the first two seasons and um, Dr. Sumner Christie she uh, stepped in and helped uh, I also have um, there's an episode this season where my friend uh, Tiffany White uh, helped film as well. Uh, it was part of a collaboration investigation. So, um, and then next year I'm actually looking at some a couple really neat options for uh, you know some filming when I'm not investigating uh, uh, alone. Uh, if I have someone you know follow me. Um, I may be talking a little bit more next season about some interesting things I'm, I'm doing with that. So, you know, things are always evolving, but, um, you know, that's something that uh, uh, has been an interesting aspect. And so uh, I'm very thankful for Dr. Sumner for stepping in and doing an amazing job with uh, following me with the camera. Um, you know, it's, it's not easy when things are happening to be a, silent you know partner or fly on the wall when when uh, stuff is going on um let's see uh i, I definitely encourage you guys uh, i've mentioned insane asylum um they uh they're exactly right you know um you need to check their stuff out as well that, um, you know, like I said, I just met them today and uh, they are out of Wisconsin, a great group of investigators. And uh, we appreciate you going on and promoting what uh, other investigators are doing. Hats off to the podcasters for sure. Um, John says, sorry, I've been talking so much, but I was wondering if you ever noticed if there's been some kind of tragedy or suicide, there's more going on than if there wasn't if you know what I'm trying to say. Uh, absolutely. And, and, and please don't apologize for your questions because I, I love the dialogue and uh, welcome that anytime. Um, yes, actually, um, we, I have noticed that, uh, especially um, when it comes to uh, a tragic event or a suicide, um, one of the episodes that I'm actually going to be covering um, has a, uh, you know, <laughs> If you've, if you've watched Ghost Biker, you know, typically um, I, I don't go toward the dark type um, investigations or um, energies. I don't seek those out, but I, I, I do love a location that has a, a very um, dark uh, story behind it. And so I usually try to cover uh, one of those at least during, um, during my episode, is, uh, during my season. And I have found that, especially when it comes to some of the ones with suicide, you know, I've often wondered sometimes if some of the activity um, isn't darker just because of the state of the location that it's left in, you know, where it's not kept up and um, just kind of dark and oppressed. Sometimes I think that um, that activity stems from from that sort of thing. Um, 
you know, it, it, it often seems like there is something more going on rather than just that specific um, event or tragedy that happened. And it could be, it could be the land. Again, it could sort of be the nature of uh, what's going on there. Um, let's see. Um, hi, Billy and Beth. Um, good to see you. Beth with the Wicked Woman. I uh, love her podcast. I hope you guys will definitely go and uh, check that out. And um, let's see, Sherry, it's good to see you as well. You know, um, just, you know, it, like I said, I'm loving the comments and loving the back and forth. Um, you know, definitely, you know, para unity is, is definitely a strong thing. And it's exciting to see that with some of the uh, new folks that, that I've met this season. Uh, over here. So I just, please just know, you know, I, I appreciate that and appreciate all you guys do. Um, looks like we're rolling into an hour here. Um, I am, you know, I'm, I know you guys can read the comments, but I'm, I'm reading those out loud because I will be uploading this onto YouTube here in uh, probably about 15 minutes and doing that as a premiere and answering questions on my YouTube channel. Um, I'm unfortunately I am not able to go live on YouTube at this time um, because I've not got enough subscribers on my YouTube channel. So um, I've been enjoying being able to do the premiere aspect on YouTube and hopefully I'm halfway there to that golden number. So hopefully soon I'll be able to uh, show some of my YouTube friends um, love as well with being able to uh, go live on that channel. So uh, anyways, um, again, thank you guys for your compliments and, uh, you know, for watching the episode, for sharing it. And again, this one was really special to me. And so, you know, if you don't watch any of them this season, I hope you, if you've not seen this one, I hope you will, will check it out because, um, it is a great story to be told and just, I feel like just good, honest spirit communication, um, during this this one so um anyways thank you all so much if there's nothing else uh i'm going to go ahead and and end this um a little bit of a little bit of business before we go um this this saturday i'm going to be at uh screamville haunted attraction in knoxville tennessee um <clears throat> and it's going to be from uh i believe it is uh 8 until 11 p.m. Uh, Eastern Standard Time. Um, they're one of, they're rated one of the scariest attractions in Knoxville. And so uh, I hope that, you know, if you're in the area, it's good family fun. Um, you know, nothing better to do. Weather's going to be a perfect 65 degrees here in the mountains. So um, I hope that I'll be there, you know, with, with my motorcycle and with ghost biker merchandise and stuff. And I want to hear your stories. So, um, there's that. And then next weekend, I'll have a little more information about it, but, um, I've mentioned Soul Sisters Paranormal. We did a collaboration at the amazing Henry River Mill Village in North Carolina. Um, we did that, uh, two years ago and, you know, for anyone that's, that's watching, um, spoiler alert, that uh, is going to actually be uh, the next week's episode is my investigation at Henry River Mill Village. And if you like an entire town that is um, a ghost town, then um, you will definitely love this location. That uh, was my first investigation with Soul Sisters Paranormal. So I'm excited to be able to put that information out there. And... Um, that that will be next week but next weekend um that's piggybacking off of that um uh, episode where we will be there they're doing their after dark tours and it's going to be on the 23rd and 24th and so soul sisters and i will be doing um and and it's a special treat because i get both of um the doctors sumner at uh, there, both uh, both of the twins, uh, Christy and Jenny, will be there uh, doing the presentation, and um, I'll I'll have that information posted. Um, it, there's two tours per night, 
and we'll be doing the presentation about our investigation. So it's a real honor to be invited back there. And, um, you know, we got two more episodes coming up and we'll have two more of these live sessions on Thursday nights. So uh, if there are no other questions, then uh, we will wrap this up. I'm going to check real quick. Um, yes, uh, thank you all. If, if Please, please share uh, my YouTube if you don't mind. I, I really do appreciate that. That would, that would mean a lot. Um, and Sherry says, I hope to meet you, Miranda. So many of my friends love you. I know you're awesome. Thank you, Sherry. That, that means a lot. And I'm hoping that uh, we'll be able to meet soon as well. Like I said, I love hearing your stories. Um, <clears throat> Soul Sisters is great and they do great work too, uh, is, is a insane asylum, excuse me, insane asylum says. I know that they were on your show as well. So um, again, uh, thank you all so much for your kind words and I hope you have a blessed and wonderful evening and until next Tuesday night, if I don't see you on Saturday, I'll see you right back here for episode three of season three. Take care.